good sunny Tuesday to everyone, and thank you for attending our Investment Currents Live Town Hall event this afternoon. It's great to see and hear so many of you, and we look forward to an excellent and interactive session today. I am Jim Jacobson, Senior VP and Wealth Advisor with Gerard, and with us today is Chief, uh, Chief Investment Officer of Gerard, Tim Chubb. We have a full list of topics to cover due in large part to this rather strange and headline-making year that we've seen thus far in 2020. To begin with, we'll review where the markets and economy have been and what's been driving those moves. Then we'll give you an update on the Federal Reserve's recent somewhat subtle but rather impactful change of language. And then we'll conclude with insights on the election, both from a historical perspective and also a current perspective. Uh, first up, a couple of housekeeping items to begin with. The first one being that we are recording this presentation, so if you're not able to stay on the entire time, then you can visit our website, meetgerard.com, where you will find the recording posted with the next few days. Again, that's meetgerard.com. Also, we welcome you to send in questions via the Q&A box, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx window. So for those of you that have come in through the uh, web today, look in the bottom right corner, you'll see a Q&A box, and you simply click on the letters QA, and that will allow you to type in your question. Finally, let me call your attention to the disclosure slide regarding forward-looking statements and how we reference Gerard. I'll pause for a moment to let your eyes review that. All right. Now, before we turn things over to Tim, let's take a quick audience poll to get a sense of current thinking out there in the field. So the first question up is always a doozy, especially in a year like this year. So which of the following concerns you most? And the tabulations will come in shortly, and we'll see where we're at. This is much easier than going to the polls, right? Still chugging along. Questions, surveys, answers. Tim and I wait. And here we go. Place your bets. Place our bets, exactly. Whoa, hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> These are interesting questions because we're thinking that perhaps the election outcome is the one that's going to be driv uh, driven by most people's uh, minds, given that we're one month away. And the poll is now ended. Let's see where we come up with results. I don't want to push WebEx, but I'm waiting. Come on, Cisco, you better come through for us here. There we go. Hey, I was right. 54% in the election outcome. 29% the economic recovery, 6% stock market valuations, and 2% global geopolitical issues. So um, very timely, in fact, uh, that election outcome is something we're going to be talking about later on in the presentation today, and the economic recovery uh, is certainly uh, paramount as well. So let's hit that second question now. Uh, this one is what area of the capital markets do you expect to perform best in 2021? So looking forward next year. Do you think that U.S. stocks will outperform, or will it be foreign stocks? Will it be bonds? Or will it be alternatives, such as precious metals and commodities and however else one might define um, alternatives? That's always a fun topic. That can be a survey question all to itself. So I'll pause and let everybody answer. I'm going to throw in my answer, too. The poll has now ended, and we will have the results shortly. Tim, what's your bet? Well, maybe you shouldn't say. <laughs> I'll tell you what I, I picked. <clears throat> Let's see what comes up. Okay, so interesting. 52% of the people chose U.S. stocks to be the number one performing asset class next year, followed by foreign stocks at 21%, uh, and only nine to bonds with 11% being alternatives. So probably not a shocking answer there. And um, while Tim and I do have all the answers for the future, you do actually have to pay us extra amounts of money for us to tell you that. No, we don't. We don't. I'm kidding. But U.S. stocks is uh, the overwhelming choice there. So, all right, well, let's get into that. That was kind of fun to see and get an idea of where people's minds are. Uh, Tim, I'm going to step out of the way now and let you take it from here. Everybody, this is Gerard's Chief Investment Officer, Tim Chubb. 
All right. Thanks, Jim. And, and thanks for everyone taking the time to join us today. Um, and, and thanks for entertaining us with the polling questions. We thought that was a fun way to start off things. Um, just to get some perspective on what's really at the top of your mind, of course, our advisors, our, our team is speaking with clients all day long, um, but we really like to, to hear from a broad audience to see just you know how concerned you are about um, you know, the issues that we face coming into next year and, of course, what your expectations are. Um, personally, I'll answer, the, uh, I guess, for, for myself. I, I personally think that uh, the economic recovery is paramount. Um, the news just recently that uh, it's not likely it will uh, get another stimulus package until after the election is expected and disappointing. Um, and, and as a result, I think the economic recovery is of critical importance. And I actually think foreign stocks will outperform the U.S. next year for the first time in a long time. And uh, perhaps we can get into some reasons why during Q&A. Um, but, you know, I guess as we enter the fourth quarter, hard to believe, and, and fortunately 2020 is coming to an end soon, uh, I think investors uh, are finding themselves torn between optimism about the prospects for the economic growth uh, after uh, what will be a really impressive rebound in GDP in uh, this coming quarter and, and likely the fourth quarter, um, and, all, and, and torn between that and anxiety now that we're less than one month away, obviously, uh, it's at the top of your mind as far as the election is concerned um, and, and what uncertainty that may bring depending upon uh, what the outcome is. And we may not know uh, for some time after uh, as a result of all the mail-in uh, voting. So uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, before we dive into some recent economic data, of course, we'll give you some thoughts on the election and hopefully uh, calm your mind a little bit there. We'll start by recapping the market performance for the third quarter. Um, and despite a number of headwinds, including COVID-19 cases on the rise, the upcoming election, failure to pass what will likely be the fifth and, and potentially final round of fiscal stimulus from Congress, uh, risk assets across the board continue to move higher thanks to uh, really rapidly and, and surprisingly improving economic data. Uh, massive, massive uh, stimulus both on the monetary policy front uh, and fiscal policy front that we saw earlier this year that's still trickling through the economy. Uh, and of course, the optimism surrounding the COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapies. And so uh, U.S. stocks really rallied sharply for the second straight quarter uh, in the last three months and saw the S&P 500 index and the NASDAQ composite hit a string of new record highs. Uh, the S&P 500 was up 8.5% for the quarter and now up 4.1% uh, through uh, the end of uh, September. NASDAQ gained about 11% for the quarter and was up a little over 24% for the year, uh, despite declining about 5% in September. And then the Russell 2000 index, which measures smaller U.S. companies, uh, typically with a market cap of, of less than $2 billion, rose about 5%. Uh, and is still down about 9% for the year. Looking outside the U.S., on the foreign side of things, uh, the MSCI EFI, uh, which is Europe, Australasia, the, in the Far East, which measures uh, developed U.S. stock performance, excuse me, ex-U.S. stock performance um, of Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, rose about 5% during the quarter and is still down 7% year-to-date. And then emerging market companies posted the best return up about 95 um, now down just 1% in the first nine months of this year. Uh, last but not least, your favorite topic, <laughs> according to the polls at least, uh, the bond market, uh, excuse me, posted modest returns as well. Uh, the Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, which is like the S&P 500 for fixed income, rose about six-tenths of 1% for the quarter, bringing its return for the year uh, almost to 7%. And the Bloomberg Barclays Municipal Index, which again measures, um, unlike the aggregate, which is more on taxable bonds, uh, municipals, municipal uh, issues, and uh, that rose about one and a quarter percent for the last three months, bringing the return to just over three percent year to date. Last but not least, uh, the Bloomberg Barclays Corporate High Yield Index, which measures uh, below investment grade corporate bonds, jumped about five percent and is now finally positive for the year of about six tenths of one percent. So um, again, economic momentum remained elevated throughout the quarter, surprising many investors, myself included. Uh, the bulk of the focus was on the labor market as the unemployment rate, as this chart shows, uh, fell for the fifth straight month in September to 7.9%, which was down from 8.4% a month earlier uh, and down from its peak of 14.7% uh, that we saw, unfortunately, back in April. 
Um, unfortunately, the most recent job report in September um, had a lot to do with the decline from 8.4 to 7.9, had a lot to do with um, the labor force participation rate. So uh, Americans actually leaving the workforce is what drove that number down half of 1%. Uh, it was a pretty significant number. Some jobs were added, of course. Uh, the market liked the report overall. Um, but it was something that we need to keep our eye on as we um, go through the month of October and November without that additional fiscal stimulus. Uh, housing market remained a recovery bright spot, both on new home sales, building, um, renovations. We've seen tons of refinancing activity um, and, and lots and lots of people taking advantage of the low interest rate environment. Uh, and earnings resilience of the S&P 500 uh, companies uh, was a major theme for the quarter, uh, beating the estimates of what was expected for the second quarter, uh, which was driven by a combination of lower expectations, what I like to call the Wall Street two-step. If you lower the bar low enough, it's easy to jump over. Um, and then the cushion from fiscal stimulus, of course, cost cutting from these companies, um, and really the, the pandemic-driven acceleration of a number of secular growth trends, which we highlighted during our last report. Um, for the first time since 2018, uh, analysts that uh, cover S&P 500 companies are raising estimates for their, uh, next year. I believe the average is now around $170 uh, in, in, in earnings per share EPS for the S&P, uh, which doesn't make uh, the S&P 500 on a forward basis nearly look as overvalued as it does on a trailing basis. Um, you know, as far as the GDP as a, as a country is concerned, um, as you can see here for the second quarter, we had a decline over 31%, largest quarterly drop that we've ever seen uh, for the S&P, or excuse me, for the U.S. GDP, and that's goods and services that we produce as a country, good uh, GDP, uh, gross domestic product. And uh, recent uh, economic data, as I mentioned, has been extremely positive. And um, many analysts and, and economists are expecting an equally impressive 35% gain quarter over quarter for the third quarter, uh, which we'll get some insight into very shortly. And while this may appear to be a V-shaped recovery, I think we all need to recognize that there's continuing effects of the pandemic. Um, there's lots of indecision on the fiscal stimulus front, which certainly could cause growth to moderate into next year. Uh, and we hope we can finish um, the year strong from a, a GDP uh, perspective in the fourth quarter. Um, September ended without a deal on the fifth coronavirus um, relief bill, uh, which had been widely expected over the course of the quarter. Uh, obviously, it's been well documented in the news that Democrats and Republicans remain uh, far apart in size and scope of the package, uh, and the already difficult negotiation has been further complicated recently uh, with the Supreme Court vacancy, as well as several Republican officials, including President Trump, uh, contracting the coronavirus. As far as our expectations uh, moving at, uh, forward, our investment committee expects that growth should moderate uh, to roughly 2 to 3% during the first half of 2021 before accelerating again in the back half of next year. Uh, likely at that point, we'll see a vaccine being widely distributed, and I think it, uh, hopefully we'll be able to return to uh, normalcy as far as um, the economy is concerned and consumption is concerned uh, once we, we, we receive that vaccine. Um, backing up for a second, you know, taking a look at this year and the decline that we saw in the second quarter and then the uh, likely rise in the third quarter, if the third quarter growth number of 35% is realized, it would still leave real GDP about 4% below pre-COVID trends and about 3% below the level of GDP in the last quarter of 19. And to put that in the context, uh, it was about equal to what we experienced during the global financial crisis in which we saw GDP decline about 4%, um, which obviously highlights the magnitude of the last recession, and it also gives you some perspective on just how violent the recession that we just went through um, will be and, and as we look back uh, over the course of, of the entirety of the year. Um, 2021 will still be the recovery, the year of recovery for the economy, uh, but like I just mentioned, ultimately the timing of normalcy hinges on the timing of a widely distributed vaccine. So with that said, uh, expectations for near-term vaccine breakthrough remain supportive. Uh, throughout September, there were four vaccine candidates in late state trials within the United States. Public health officials continue to discuss the potential for the FDA to grant emergency use, author use authorization uh, as early as November. I think we'll likely see healthcare workers uh, get that first, and it'll be sometime in the early part of next year. 
um, for the rest of us Americans to, to gain access uh, more broadly to the vaccine. Um, and certainly there's been some upbeat headlines surrounding treatments and rapid testing uh, late in September, which bode well for our, our ability to really get our arms around how many cases that we're still dealing with on a daily basis. Yeah, that's really good information, Tim. Thank you for that recap of, of where we've been in this year that seemed to go so incredibly slowly, at least to me, in the early part of the spring and summer, but now it seems like it's blazing by. Here we are in October already. Um, and since our July update, the markets have had a lot to chew on related to all of this, and uh, not to mention monetary policy, largely due to Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's presentation in August at the Jackson Hole. A 2020 Economic Policy Symposium, which they did virtually this year. That was kind of interesting to watch. Uh, the language is very subtle, but the long-term implications could be huge, very similar to the way I think of an aircraft pilot that might adjust the direction of travel by just one degree, but over the course of a 10,000-mile journey, that could end up in a very different destination. So, Tim, uh, tell us more about what was said at that uh, Federal Reserve meeting out there in Jackson Hole. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about monetary policy as an investment committee, um, and we try to spend some time talking about it with our clients, too, and it's not necessarily something you hear about that often, certainly on CNBC, but not necessarily covered uh, in the national news too regularly. But um, the Fed has always attempted to act in what we would consider a proactive capacity to prevent the economy from overheating when the labor market is reaching full employment and when inflation uh, via what they use as a personal consumption expenditures index or PCE, it's a, a inflation non, it's a way to measure inflation similar to CPI has been nearing their 2% target. Um, so again, the goal of the Fed is full employment, which typically means an unemployment rate of somewhere between four to five percent, four to four and a half percent or lower, um, and then ultimately reaching an inflation target of about 2%. And some inflation is a good thing. Um, it's like driving a car up a, a, a steep hill very slowly. Um, if we're con as consumers expecting that cost of goods will go down in time, we may delay those purchases, uh, which has a compounding um, sort of ripple effect, which uh, ultimately very much damages the economy. And so 2% um, has been their target. Um, this groundwork was actually laid in the 1980s when central banks around the world were eager to lower inflation. Um, and then in 1996, when officials uh, sort of behind closed doors made 2% their uh, official definition of uh, price stability, uh, it's really what we've been looking at as, as investors uh, and economists uh, as far as, you know, seeing and trying to predict what moves the Fed will make as far as tightening monetary policy by raising interest rates and so on. Um, and, and kind of a fun fact, I had to look this up, actually, I, you know, sort of common knowledge, at least amongst us, um, that 2% has been their target, but I was wondering when um, officially the FOMC or the Federal Open Market Committee um, came out and said that uh, publicly stated that 2% was their target, and it wasn't actually until 2012. So um, in any case, inflation has failed to reach 2% for many, many years, um, and really the broad agreement amongst FOMC um, and the Federal Reserve governors has been that the neutral interest rate has fallen in recent years due to below average economic growth. Uh, and as a result, the FOMC found it appropriate to change of directive um, to what they call an average inflation targeting where inflation would need to sustain itself at that 2% number for a period of time uh, before the Fed reacted with tighter monetary policy. And again, an example of that would be raising interest rates. In the past, the Fed was more pro proactive in raising rates to prevent the economy from overheating and inflation to, get, uh, to run away. Now the Fed is basically admitting growth will remain low for long, um, rates will remain low for long as a result, um, and, and you know we're, we're in need of sort of adjusting how we look at um, monetary policy and, and reacting to, to the economy and its growth and inflation uh, with monetary policy moving forward. So uh, again, ultimately for clients, investors, this means low rates are more certain uh, for a longer period of time, and it provides more certainty surrounding the Fed reaction to improving economic conditions. Um, so again, unfortunately, low rates, low growth for long, it's what the Fed is telling you. It's literally been our playbook for the last 10 years or so, um, managing your money, and it's likely to be the playbook uh, in the coming years as well, unless we really start to see growth accelerate uh, and inflation accelerate 
uh, which is certainly possible, but unlikely without significant levels of population and productivity growth. So um, again, I, I know it's highly technical, uh, but I thought it, it really was worth highlighting because um, it certainly is a, a, a significant shift in, in sort of the mentality and framework that they have used historically. Um, and as the chart shown here, the federal funds target rate, we're basically at near zero rates right now. Um, Chair Powell recently has quipped that we're not thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. And so I, I think the moral of the story is um, we've gotten a lot of clarity on what the framework will be in the coming years. And unfortunately, that means for our clients who are in their retirement years that we won't anticipate seeing interest rates move higher and therefore uh, the yield on their portfolio will remain quite low. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's a it's a sea change in a lot of ways, although it's very subtle. Um, and I think that's the key thing is over the course of time, we're going to look back and say, oh, wow, that thing they did back in 2020, that, that really reset the base. Um, Sim, uh, so, Tim, now before we get into some thoughts on the election, which I know is, the, is a, a driving theme for many people, um, a lot of clients have been asking what has been driving this market higher. They're sort of shocked and, and maybe some of all, maybe all of us are by how fast the market did recover. How, how far up the indices have gone uh, over the last couple of months, you know, despite this economic crash and then recovery, um, although a different sort of recovery, the global recession and a whole wide range of uncertain economic outcomes due to the uh, pandemic and the election. Could you just kind of summarize some of these key themes as to what has really been supporting and driving this market? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. And um, I think one of those key themes is right there with the Fed funds target rate at zero. Um, and then there's the uh, total assets of the Federal Reserve or the, the Fed's balance sheet uh, of assets, which is a, a massive, a massive uh, change that we saw since the beginning of this year. And so uh, I, I sort of call it the four legs to a chair. You know, I think there's really four things that are driving risk assets, both in equities and fixed income. First and foremost, the fiscal and monetary policy support and stimulus has been absolutely enormous as far as size, speed, scope. Uh, to support the capital markets and the broader economy. More fiscal stimulus is expected, of course. Monetary policy, as I just mentioned, will remain accommodative uh, and extremely easy uh, for a very long period of time. Um, and you know, as this chart shows, while the Federal Balance Sheet, Federal Reserve Balance Sheet, excuse me, has expanded and contracted over time, uh, you can see from the 2007 to 2008, this first little jump up here, um, we had, the Fed had decided to take the balance sheet through all the iterations of quantitative easing from about $870 billion in August of 07 uh, to about $4.5 trillion in 2015. Uh, and then as a result of tightening monetary policy, improving economic conditions, inflation was picking up over the course of uh, the early part of 2016 and 2017. In October of 2017, the Fed began bringing down the balance sheet uh, which again is a measure, um, uh, sort of a measure or at least a, a, a sign that they believe the economy is on strong footing um, and brought it down from four and a half trillion to about 3.8 trillion before the recent stimulus that was necessary which ballooned the Fed balance sheet to over $7 trillion. And so uh, again, going from 3.8 to 7 trillion, putting $3 trillion into um, you know, the, the, the market and the economy is a massive, massive amount of stimulus and, uh, you know, I, I know we'll be getting into the election soon, but it's the reason why I said the Federal Reserve and their decisions are much more important than who's in the White House. It's this chart right here showing that, you know, the balance sheet absolutely exploding from about $4 trillion to $7 trillion. Uh, Ultimately, that's going to be a significant contribution of what drives uh, risk assets or equities or, or fixed income and is in um, uh, what we consider risk assets over the long run. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is negative real interest rates. And so uh, what that means is uh, basically interest rates after inflation. And while they continue to push lower, um, this ultimately gives a boost to equities and equity valuation or, or stock valuations rather. Um, and so for you know example, at the end of the, the third quarter, um, the 10-year U.S. Treasury was about seven-tenths of 1% with a, a yield of 0.70. Um, and with the most recent inflation reading of about 1.6%, uh, this is implying a real return after inflation of almost 1% per year over the next 10 years. And so uh, as a result for many investors, um, investable assets are, are in short supply and limited real returns posed by many asset classes on the fixed income side 
are likely driving um, investors, our clients, and certainly our firm into risk assets um, to take advantage of that opportunity that presents itself when interest rates are so low. Number three, uh, investor sentiment is far from stretched. Um, we would be much more concerned if our everyday conversations with you all uh, would be how uh, they could, you, know, you could get more equity or stock exposure um, and that you wanted to add risk to the portfolio. But the reality is uh, literally the opposite has been our conversation. Uh, we've been hearing from clients, why are we at all time highs? Uh, as Jim had stated all earlier. And so investor sentiment is far from stretch. I'd argue that we're not in that euphoric stage that uh, we often talk about. And then last but not least, science. Every day we're getting closer to a successful vaccine, which can bring the economy back online in a normal capacity. And so until one of these four key legs of the chair, if you will, are removed, it's really tough to get too negative on the market's prospects, especially if the election outcome is not likely to impact any of these keys in a negative way, and I just don't think that's likely. Um, and, and so as a result, you know, I, I honestly would consider any pullback to be seen uh, as nothing more than a technical correction, in my opinion. And so, you know, the economic recovery, it'll likely be protracted. We, keep, you know, I'm excited to see normal consumer and, cor and corporate um, behavior start to, to come about as a result of the vaccine. Um, and as you would expect, you know, we're likely to say, you know, investors should stay fully invested now and remain so throughout the election. Yeah, I think you're right, Tim. I mean, it, it is, I have, I don't think I've had one conversation this year with somebody that said, oh my gosh, load me up with more. Uh, it's been more and more the, are you sure we're in the right things? I don't want to fall off a cliff here. And, and that sentiment thing is something that I don't think it's a lot of press, but it's one of those emotional indicators that is, is usually quite, uh, quite telling. So um, speaking of emotions, so for investors and markets still reeling from the global pandemic and now facing this kind of unusual economic recovery, a different source of uncertainty is now just one month away, literally four weeks from today. Here we go. And that is, of course, the U.S. presidential election. Uh, a more predictable aspect of any election cycle is heightened volatility. We almost always expect that in the months leading up to the vote as markets continuously attempt to price in the future of one policy, uh, of one administration's policies versus, uh, versus the other. Um, and while this volatility is typically pretty short-lived, it does sometimes concern investors. Uh, so, Tim, give us your thoughts as we approach this election four weeks away. What are you thinking? Yeah, sure, <clears throat> sure, Jim. Um, if we could maybe jump back to that last chart, I'd just like to point something out real quick. Um, I know this is a little bit of a complicated chart, but really what it's trying to express to you is sort of give you some um, at least perspective on what type of volatility that we may expect and what investors are already trying to price into the market. Um, this is what we call implied volatility. It's it's uh, a function of option contracts and what we expect the variability of returns to look like uh, around certain dates. And so that's why it says 327, excuse me, 3725 strike um, implied volatility. It's, it's the volatility that we may expect and, and investors trying to price that volatility in. And you can see here that, you know, coming up to the election day and then even beyond that, that investors are pricing in uh, quite a bit of volatility. And so that 29.5 on the left-hand side, and, you know, again, it seems to be sort of in that range of, you know, high 20s to low 30s, uh, is implying that investors are ex expecting quite a bit of volatility. Uh, and historically speaking, that's actually double the volatility uh, that we, we typically expect, and we'll get into that chart in a little bit. Um, but if we could flip back to the next slide, um, uh, and, and while we expect volatility to continue as we approach the election and beyond, um, it's really a function of and markets not liking uncertainty and binary outcomes, black, white, zero, one. You know, it's just not something that the market really likes to comprehend, uh, and we know that they don't like uncertainty. But uh, over time, uh, what this chart shows is market returns are bipartisan in that the S&P 500 has registered a positive return in 17 of the last 19 presidential cycles. And I know you might be saying, but this time is different. We've never had so much polarization between the two political parties. I've been doing this long enough. Jim's been doing this long enough. I feel like we say that every four years when it comes to the election. Uh, and what this shows is, you know, it, it's not likely to cause, um, you know, the market, um, excuse me, the election is not likely to cause the market uh, to have too significant of uh, a volatility and, 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 and B, a negative return profile. And you can see here the two years within the last 
going back to what is that 1944. Um, you can see it's 2008, which I would argue had nothing to do with election at all. It was everything to do with excesses within the economy and the real estate uh, market. And uh, number two, uh, excuse me, the second negative return was 2000 when we had the tech bubble, uh, which absolutely had nothing to do with the election itself and everything to do with the valuation of technology companies. And so my point is here, um, it's very, um, it's not very typical for us to see, again, a, a significant amount of volatility um, and, and also, you know, a return profile for the S&P 500 U.S. stock market of being negative. Certainly, uh, past performance isn't a guarantee of future results. But, I, you know, I, I think there's really three key considerations that we need to discuss um, that you need to be aware of ahead of the election, and I'll, I'll summarize them as quickly as possible. What's up for grabs? What are the policy issues that will impact the market? And how should we position our portfolios? Uh, I'll try to be as direct as possible because I think ultimately um, that's what our, our clients are asking us on these conference calls. Um, so first, what's up for grabs? Beyond the White House, which I would argue is the least important when ranking the importance of Congress and the Federal Reserve, again, that's a personal belief, um, that despite this race being really contentious with deep partisan divide, uh, which again, I feel like they say every election, um, there is a clear front runner. And so as of yesterday, I was pulling the data uh, from real clear politics. They showed Joe Biden with a 9% lead over President Donald Trump up from about 6% uh, earlier in the third quarter. Um, Biden has shown to have significant advantages amongst voters uh, or likely voters in several battleground states, including Pennsylvania and Ohio, where we have large uh, amounts of clients. Uh, and unlike in 2016, when Hillary Clinton's polling data swung widely um, from an 11% advantage to being even at one point, uh, Biden's lead has pretty much been consistent through um, since the start of the year. Um, while the processes for um, the national election polling have improved over the years, uh, it can never be an exact replication of the actual election. Obviously, in 2016, polls were predicting that Hillary Clinton uh, would be uh, victorious, and, and she had a three-point lead coming into the election. Uh, however, as we know, when the dust settled, even though she earned more popular votes, she lost the Electoral College, which uh, obviously surprised investors. Um, and as a result, most of us are still uh, much more skeptical of national polls than we have been. So uh, when push comes to shove and the House of Reps, uh, all 435 seats are up for re-election. Democrats hold 232. Um, they have to retain 218 to maintain control. And given the natural advantages of incumbents, um, and combined with you know their currently favorable polling numbers, that's a likely outcome that the Democrats will maintain their um, exposure or, or, or majority within the House um, come November or December, whenever we ultimately get those results. Uh, in the Senate, which I would argue is the most important thing, uh, to be looking at these races. The Republican Party currently has the majority uh, holding 53 of the 100 seats. And during this election, 50, excuse me, 35 Senate seats are being contested. Uh, Republicans hold about 23, for, uh, excuse me, 23 seats, or it's about 67, 66% of the contested seats. And for um, them to achieve a majority, Democrats will need to win three of these Republican controlled seats and retain their 12, of course. Um, if a new vice president is Democrat for if not. So that's one, what's up for grabs? Um, second, what are the policy issues that the market may face after the election uh, based upon who is elected? And so as if the election themselves were difficult enough to predict, um, the likely policy outcomes are going to be even harder. And currently the markets appear to be tempting the price in this blue wave. Uh, with expectations for Democrats to take control of the White House and both chambers of Congress. Um, in this scenario, based upon the recent debate, campaign speeches, and candidate websites, which we tried to document in this chart below of some of the key issues, uh, it seems as though a blue Congress would prioritize tax increases both on corporations and uh, American families and individuals, uh, an infrastructure bill, which has been widely talked about for many, many years now, uh, Health care reform, which um, we can get into a little bit, I suppose, um, just to name a few. And so even prior to the massive government spending initiatives aimed at supporting U.S. consumers and businesses amongst, amidst the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, a top priority for the next administration will surely be reducing the debt burden. Trump and Biden have two different approaches. President Trump's preferred tactic wants to grow out of the debt. Uh, his plan is to spend, 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 so the U.S. economy rages and roars uh, and able to grow itself out of the, the, this debt situation. 
um, and, and likely cut taxes rather than raise them to push nominal growth rates above market interest rates. Um, while this method may be very popular amongst the electorate, history tells us that it's rarely been successful, uh, especially without also triggering, triggering higher inflation, uh, which remains, uh, I think, a, an outside concern of ours at this point, um, but would be a concern of ours should President Trump uh, win re-election. By contrast, um, Vice President Biden's plan includes, as I mentioned, tax increases, as, as everyone uh, probably knows at this point. Uh, his campaign has already stated that they may partially uh, reverse President Trump's corporate tax income reduction, which cut the tax rate uh, back in 2017 from 35 percent to 21 percent, uh, raising the corporate income tax to 28 percent, as, as he's per proposed um, would certainly help with a U.S. budget deficit, which is um, growing by the day, it seems. Um, and estimates could uh, have, uh, third party estimates have shared that it could boost revenues um, for old Uncle Sam by about $4 trillion over 10, 10 years, uh, which equates to about 1.5% of GDP. So of the political issues we just highlighted, raising taxes is likely to have the largest effect on the overall stock market. After all, higher taxes reduces earnings and therefore corporate valuations, and the market needs to reprice itself as a result of that. And while Biden's campaign is well known for its plan to raise taxes, um, certainly nothing is set in stone. And so if President Biden were to win um, in this fragile yet improving economic recovery, uh, he may choose to either delay tax reform or water down his tax pike proposals, uh, or, or like I said, better yet, postpone until he seeks uh, to provide the necessary stimulus to the U.S. economy. Um, of course, if he were to raise business costs during unstable economic recovery, uh, raising business costs, raising taxes, uh, it could cement his presidency as single term, something I doubt he wants to do. Um, so instead, he might focus uh, his efforts on some of the more easier social wins and uh, certainly the strong economic recovery and repairing the labor market coming out of this COVID-induced recession. Um, so last point, third and last consideration, how should you, uh, how should our clients position their portfolios amongst these, amid these current market drivers? Um, and, and certainly it can be, you know, somewhat easy for investors to let their pro political persuasion uh, impact or long-term financial judgment. Honestly, uh, market timing surrounding election is probably uh, one of the most, if not the most, destructive decision an investor can make. Uh, we've had calls from clients for the last several months asking us to make short-term portfolio adjustments or attempt to step away from the markets based upon how they see the election playing out. Um, but looking at this chart, which takes uh, S&P 500 or stock market data uh, going back to literally the 1800s, uh, gives you some perspective what the average return is during non-election years versus the average return during election years. And so um, the, uh, excuse me, the gray lines show an average return of non-election years about 10.9%. It shows the average return during election years uh, of 10.2%, uh, which was you know, about uh, a significant part of the time, 40 periods out of 120. Um, and I guess my point is here, um, that deviation of about seven tenths of a percent from a statistical perspective is literally just noise. Um, and so while political pundits and investors are quick to suggest that Democrats in office can be bad for stocks, and while Republican control will be more beneficial, the truth is that both parties have a really strong track record and positioning a portfolio as a result is relatively straightforward. So again, you know, given today's extremely easy financial conditions due to federal, excuse me, fiscal and monetary policy um, stimulus, um, Liquidity is you know, certainly uh, available in the markets and has been a key support, um, driving them the new record highs as we suffer you know, one of the worst uh, social and health crises, uh, hopefully that we ever go through. Um, and while election noise may feel concerning, we don't feel as though any potential outcome should be a reason to go against these four fundamental drivers that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and we're not, you know, and as a result, we plan on not significantly changing our portfolio allocations as a result. So, I guess my final point is remember that neither political party in the White House nor the majority in Congress will alter the direction of the Federal Reserve, which ultimately I view as most important. So, again, for investors to reduce long-term investment all allocations because they believe in a particular political view, uh, I think is taking a stance against the ability to the U.S. economy to grow at all. And as a result, you know, we continue to preach a long-term approach that's likely suited for investors who even may be worried about the election 
uh, an outcome in Washington later this year. So again, pre-election polls don't have a perfectly predictive track record, neither do market expectations. Um, and considering the overwhelming belief that Trump uh, victory in 2016 would be negative for risk assets, in fact, until the COVID-19 crisis, President Trump presided over uh, what was basically um, if one of the best, if not the best, market performance in decades, uh, wrong footing many investors who expected a catastrophic impact on the U.S. economy. Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey for sure and an interesting journey coming up. But I, I think one of the things you said uh, really sums it up. And, um, you know, taking a political stance one way or another is kind of akin to taking a stance against the American economy. And I'm not trying to make that political, uh, but it would be saying, hey, I don't think the American economy and corporations can adapt as they have in the past. And I think history has shown that a, 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 you don't want to short the market like that. Um, so thank you, Tim, very much for those uh, insightful comments. Um, just going to double check to see if anybody has any questions. If you do, in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, you will see a Q&A button or a Q&A, literally the initials QA. You just click on that and you can submit your question. Uh, so go ahead and do so now if you want, and if not, I'll continue to roll on. Um, Tim, I, I think one of your things that you mentioned was uh, a, that it was noise, that difference between 10.9 and 10.2 in election versus non-election years. So, um, you know, allowing, allowing the noise to pass, um, that makes me think of a line often attributed to Abraham Lincoln. I don't really know if he said it. I wasn't alive when, when Abe was around, but a lot of people say he was the one that said it, but I've seen it on memes too, so who knows. Um, he said this too shall pass, and I think in the heart of the Civil War, uh, four brilliant words. And uh, while we certainly do not take lightly the events of our times, it is incredibly important to keep things in their proper context and historical perspective. And as we mentioned in our call this past spring when the market was doing backflips, um, you know, we modern humans haven't faced much in the way of global pandemics. You know, uh, mumps, polio, measles, rubella, we beat them all. Uh, but the world and mankind as a whole, as a species, certainly has seen this. And, and you know what? We learned. We learned how to adapt, adjust, and evolve. And many parallels exist with the, the four-year presidential cycle. There's always a barrage of emotion-laden headlines on top of the constant campaign rhetoric that we hear, and that can easily distract us from our core operations of watching the American economy grow. There's, there's never a straight line to the finish, nor do simple answers exist to these complex questions. The, the world is not a matrix, believe it or not. It's not a binary algorithm, but, but rather more like a da Vinci painting, a masterpiece. It's got layers of color that add subtlety, nuance, beauty, complexity that maybe some people don't like. They just like a cartoon drawing, but I'd rather have a Da Vinci any day. Uh, but that also brings ambiguity that requires hard work and serious thinking, plus the need for us to check our emotions and keep our logic in the forefront. I don't know for sure what will happen on November 3rd, but I am extremely confident that on November 4th, Apple will be making iPhones, Clorox will be making bleach, probably more than ever, Tesla will be making electric cars, and Honeywell will be making thermostats. So, so take heart and be engaged with the process. And remember that your emotions are for friends, family, and football, not for your investment portfolio. Uh, one of the many reasons clients hire us is to release themselves, not only from the time required to manage their assets, but also the emotional burden of such. We're here to take on those roles, plus take a comprehensive approach to overall financial planning from A to Z. So be sure to reach out to us after this call accordingly. I believe we do have some questions coming in, so I'm just gonna pause here. Um, my question guru behind the glass, socially distancing from me, will will uh, bring them up to me shortly, and uh, we'll address these. Tim, I'm going to let you take this first question. Trump pulled the plug on stimulus talks literally this afternoon as I was on my way driving to the presentation. Um, let me be careful how that's phrased. That was how the question was phrased. I, that's not my language. I'm not taking sides one way or another. But apparently some talks broke down today with uh, the second round of stimulus. So what might the short-term impact be? I'll give that one to you, Tim. Yeah, great question. And, and um, it, Emily, if it's okay with you, I'd like to maybe go back to that final slide just a little bit after I answer this question to highlight a couple things. Um, but as far as you know, the, the, the recent headline that President Trump asked, uh, Republicans to, um, you know, stop stimulus talks until after the election. I certainly think it'll have a short and long-term impact on, on, on the market. Uh, ultimately, as I mentioned throughout most of the presentation, you know, stimulus is really important. I, I think it's even more important than who ultimately ends up in the White House. Uh, stimulus from the Federal Reserve, stimulus from Congress, 
And while the economic recovery has really surprised me um, in, in, in the level that we've rebounded, we've had this V-shaped recovery, it's been absolutely astounding to see uh, the resilience of the American economy over the last six months. Um, I, I think a large contributor of that resiliency has been stimulus. And so um, we need a fifth and final round, perhaps final round, a fifth round of stimulus. Um, I don't necessarily like to see the fiscal, you know, situation of the U.S., you know, our, our, our debt load expand and budget deficits to continue to expand. Um, but I think just as much as all the quantitative easy and monetary policy decisions were extremely important to support the markets and the economy coming out of the global financial crisis, I view all the fiscal stimulus and monetary policy stimulus to be equally important um, to get us out of this recession. And so, you know, when you look at what we've gone through in the last six months, literally having the better part of a quarter, um, having consumption from the U.S. consumer, you know, which is two-thirds of U.S. GDP, go to, as good as zero, right? I mean, how many uh, TSA bookings in the month of, of April were down 99%, right? There was um, many, many industries that were negatively impacted. I, I think absolutely um, that stimulus had prevented us from ha having another financial crisis, uh, maybe not as severe as what we experienced during the last one, uh, but certainly kept us, um, kept us able to fight another day. And so uh, I certainly think that, um, you know, stimulus needs to, to, to come through and, and, and soon in good order. Um, I'm just not hopeful. Um, at, I wasn't hopeful and that headline sort of confirmed it, that we would get something before the election, which I think is a mistake. Yeah, it is interesting. And it, it, who knows if it's uh, brinksmanship that they're playing or not, but uh, four weeks away, we'll find out. Another question has come in. This one is a really good one. And I tell you, we, we talk about this a lot with our investment committee, growth versus value, question mark. Uh, filling it in a little bit more with context, recently there's been considerable return in growth, FANG stocks in particular, and certainly with work from home, uh, driving a lot of the tech stocks. Um, do we see a move towards value in Q4 and also beyond into 2021? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so just for uh, edification or, or just, a, uh, I suppose, um, explain the difference between what growth stocks are and value stocks. So growth stocks are typically categorized as companies that are growing in access of the market or their peers or their, their respective sector. Um, so again, companies that are experiencing above average growth, whereas value companies tend to be really one of two things either very conservative companies that aren't growing very much at all, um, they're in their maturation phase uh, of, um, you know, their sort of life cycle, uh, they're distributing a lot of their earnings uh, back to shareholders in the form of buybacks or dividends, uh, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we think it's very important to own um, some value-oriented companies within our client portfolios. Uh, and then the second being businesses that are more cyclical in nature and trading at more deep discounts to um, what we would consider their intrinsic value or what the business would be worth. Uh, and, and sometimes mispricings happen like that in the market where investors just misunderstand how a company will navigate the economic cycle uh, and therefore punish that company and that could present exciting opportunities to hold buy low and sell high. Um, over the last several years, growth stocks have meaningfully outperformed value stocks, uh, largely due to us being in a low growth, low rate environment where investors are more comfortable paying up for growth names um, when the expectation that interest rates will be low and growth will be low um, is, is somewhat certain. And the reason being is when uh, growth is low and, rate, and therefore rates are low, that also means inflation is low. And value stocks tend to outperform during periods where the economy is doing extremely well, when um, the yield curve is um, it, steep, when commodity prices are rising, when inflation is picking up, um, when uh, GDP growth is exceeding um, or at least at um, its long-term average. And so as a result of what we've seen in the last decade, um, again, growth stocks have outperformed value, and we would expect that to be the case moving forward. And I think ultimately when you step back and you look at what's driving that, it's the U.S. economy failing to achieve its long-term uh, growth rate of about 3.5%. And as I sort of quipped earlier, we really view that as, as being, uh, excuse me, that the, um, that is due to the 
population growth in our country being less than 2% and due to productivity growth in our country being less than 2%. So, you know, ultimately without those things accelerating, I don't think the U.S. economy, no matter who's in the White House or who's in Congress, I mean, we might have periods where deregulation and, and having less taxes will help out the economy from and potentially could accelerate for a period of time, but I still think it's going to continue drifting back to that long run, two to two and a half percent. And if that's the case, while we might have periods where value stocks sort of have their day in the sun, uh, ultimately we expect, I expect that growth stocks will outperform value uh, moving forward. And, and as a result, um, for most of our clients, I'd say, uh, at least on this call, we've, we've incorporated those views into your portfolio. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and, and again, there's still some time here. Um, if you do have questions, just hit that Q&A button and we'll be glad to answer them. Uh, I love that question though, and it comes up all the time uh, and there's never a clear answer to it. There's always six sides, four sides, three sides. It's like a rolling coin that just keeps going on and on and on. Um, and in fact, I love that question because it helps us go off of the topic of politics, which again, that gets all the emotions. Uh, the growth versus value tends to be much more of just a quantitative question. And so from that perspective, it's, it's just a lot, it's a, it's a lot more fun to answer. Another question has come in um, with low mortgage rates combined with a hot housing market and offers above listing prices. Do you think we are at risk of overvaluations and potential defaults resulting in another economic collapse? Oh, that sounds like a question for our mortgage team, but let's have Tim take it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm happy to start, Jim. I, I know we, it's something we've talked about quite a bit. If you want to maybe share your thoughts just quickly, how to put you on yeah. the spot. Um, uh, yeah, I will. Um, and it is really interesting. I've actually had uh, a former colleague who used to work with me um, reach out to me, and he's been pushing me to put my home on the market. And I mean, he's really persuasive. I tell you, this guy could sell land in Timbuktu. And I said, well, sure, find me a price 10% over value for my home. And he said, no problem. I think I can get that. And I said, but then to make it worth my while, I need to buy a place 10% below market, and I really don't want to pay your 6% fee and $15,000 to move. And therein lies the question. There's just not a lot of supply. So until the demand and supply comes back into balance, it's really hard to see how the housing market would blow up. Uh, demand is very high, driven by low, low interest rates. Um, millennials, and there's a ton of millennials that have been holding back, holding back, and now they're looking to buy it. it. Apparently that's more and more we're seeing in the statistics. Um, and then of course you have just this just pent up demand where if people are gonna be working from home, well, wouldn't you want a nicer home? I mean, nobody wants to live in a shack. Well, maybe they wanna live in a shack, but they wanna work in a shack. So uh, there is a lot of demand and that demand looks to have some legs to it. So until supply comes on the market and there's really no reason for supply to come on the market, it's hard to see where the market would, would not, only, not only not slow down, but, but not crash. That's my take on it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Jim. I, I think the last point, there's, two, I guess, two points I want to make. One is the lending standards, you know, are nothing like they were during the global financial crisis. I mean, I just refinanced my mortgage and I feel like they asked for everything except for, you know, a, a blood test and hair follicles. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was exhaustive to make sure that, you know, you know, uh, my wife and I had the income that we stated that we did. Um, totally different from how things were during um, the global financial crisis or what led to the global financial crisis. I, I think, you know, maybe to answer um, or I guess continue on the question we just had about value stocks, I, I think one of the bright spots moving forward uh, and when talking about population growth and productivity growth is that we have a lot of exciting technology coming online in the next couple of years, 5G, various automation, autonomous vehicles. Um, and we also have a large portion of our population being millennials ultimately entering the years of their life where they're having children, they're buying their forever home, they're filling their houses up with junk. And in other words, their consumption's off the charts, much like the baby boomers was in the late 80s and early 90s. And, you know, that was a great time for innovation with the internet as well. And so I would not be surprised you know, while I expect this to be a low rate, low growth environment in the near term, um, due to those fundamentals I just mentioned, I think as we look even longer term, there's a, a lot of exciting investment opportunities as a result of all this innovation taking place. And there are a lot of investment, exciting investment opportunities um, due to the amount of consumption that's likely to take place thanks to the millennial generation and also baby boomers. Um, who will certainly be consuming more, um, you know, in, in various ways uh, than, than the prior generation just due to their size. So, um, fantastic question. 
Yeah, it is. Um, and, and this is going to be a fun one to watch play out, especially because we have this generational change. Um, it, two more questions that have come in. This is great, by the way. Keep throwing questions at us. This is what we kind of live for. Um, this one a little bit more on the mechanics, Tim. Uh, does the acquisition of TD Ameritrade by Charles Schwab have any impact on our clients? What would you say to that? Yeah, good question. So, um, you know, for, for some of our clients who are on today's calls, um, on today's call, their assets have been um, held at, at TD Ameritrade as their third party custodian. Um, recently, and in fact today, I think the deal is finalized between Charles Schwab and TD Ameritrade. Uh, the fully, you know, uh, the, the, the fully uh, announced that the deal has been closed, uh, and now over the next uh, several years, as we've heard, um, Charles Schwab and TD Ameritrade will look to combine technology and platforms to ultimately, I, I believe, become Charles Schwab at the end of the day. Um, our team has been hard at work behind the scenes. You know, this is something that was announced about a year ago. Uh, already looking to establish a relationship with Charles Schwab, which we did not have already. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, and, and candidly, I, I custody some of my personal assets at Charles Schwab um, and been very happy with them. And, and I uh, can assure you that we're already making uh, a lot of progress and, and, you know, dotting our I's and crossing our T's to already establish a relationship. So when the conversion does take place, uh, we're already well um, ingrained in sort of how the systems work. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I do think it's going to be some time. Uh, they've announced that probably, I think, sometime in 2022, 2023, uh, until everything is finally complete. Um, so, you know, we'll continue to provide updates to you as time goes on. I'm sure we'll be probably sending an email out to you soon, uh, letting you know about, you know, the deal being finalized. Uh, but I can assure you that, you know, our, our management team, um, we've been meeting on a weekly basis to, you know, prepare um, our team and, and, and your accounts um, to be ready for the conversion that takes place. Yeah, and I, I'm going to back that up. Uh, years and years ago, I won't say how many years ago, but more than a couple, um, I spent about nine years with Schwab on the retail side and, and also worked a fair amount with the institutional side. So what I see from this is literally we have the best of the best coming together. Uh, you know, Schwab would lead in one area with technology, TD would lead in another area, and it was great to watch them compete vigorously with each other. So not to be greedy, but I think we're literally getting the best of the best to triple the best. It's like an exponential, I guess that would be quadruple the best. Um, and also there will be consolidation. I think Morgan Stanley is buying E-Trade. So as we see that consolidation come up, that, that, that competition is going to drive enhanced efficiencies. And that brings down costs and brings better service. So I, I think it's going to be very good. Um, another question came in, and boy, is this a loaded one. So um, what kind of mistakes are other financial institutions and advisors making right now that we should avoid? Um, <clears throat> interesting, uh, good question. Um, <laughs> what other mistakes are other financial institutions or advisors making right now that we should avoid? Well, I don't want to uh, insinuate or denigrate that um, we're, we're superior in any way. Um, I, I think I, what I'll do is I'll answer this question as far as uh, investors are concerned more broadly. I think ultimately it's so very difficult to remove emotion um, from your investment decisions, uh, to remove your political biases uh, through your investment decisions. And one of the things that I, I cherish and we work so hard to create a culture of open-mindedness and creativity and, and hard work um, is really our investment committee. And so, you know, I have the pleasure of working with um, I think all in all, about 23 people within the Gerard organization are involved in the investment process. And so you're not just getting my ideas or Jim's ideas. Um, Jim and I both sit on our investment committee. I run it, but there are five other voting members on that team. Um, and when you look at how we you know, delineate research, we have a, a, an individual stock uh, research team. We have a fund, uh, an ETF, or what I would consider outside manager due diligence team that Jim runs. Um, and then our colleague Barry Keck up in Lehigh Valley runs our macro and asset allocation decisions. And each one of them has seven um, team members uh, that really are, are doing the investment research that feed ideas up to our investment committee. And then the job of the investment committee is to communicate to our clients uh, what those decisions and what our views are and, and ultimately you know, go on presentations like this to, to connect with you directly. And I guess my point is um, other firms, other advisors, I think and, and investors, oftentimes it's easier to allow 
uh, political bias and emotion um, infiltrate making good long-term decisions for your financial investment plans uh, because there's just one brain that's just trying to navigate through all the noise and try to find what signals are important to look at. Um, we don't have that problem, um, and, and, and many other firms don't either. We have a, a just a, a fantastic, comprehensive group of smart people um, who are ultimately you know, all getting together on a regular basis to um, bring the best ideas to the table, and it's a very democratic process that I, I take great pride in um, trying to promote so that it's not just me bringing ideas to the table or Jim bringing ideas to the table. Um, it's everybody up and down the age and experience spectrum to, you know, fixed income, the equities and everything in between. So I don't know if that was a, probably a really a PCA way of answering that question, but hopefully it gives you some perspective on our team um, and how we think that we're well positioned to help you uh, achieve your financial goals. Yeah, and I would agree, Tim, um, and this, again, might sound like company line kind of thing. I, I was trying to formulate an answer that wouldn't sound like that. So I, I, it may, but I don't mean it to be. But I think process is what is one of the, if I take a step back, that's what you're getting to. Um, you know, I often think, hey, I've got this idea and it's a great idea and then it plays out and I think, well, now I run the world, I'm a genius. And then six months later, I'm humbled greatly by something and then I say, boy, thank goodness for that investment committee that rounded that out. And that's the thing, um, it, you know, there's a process, but yet we're still able to be nimble. Uh, we don't want to ever get caught up so much in just thinking, thinking, you know, engineers are wonderful people. My, my father was a tool and die maker. and what a wonderful person, but it took him 20 years before I finally just compelled him to get into the stock market, and he made far more money there than anything else, and, and he was very successful. And it was, I said, hey, you just got to stop thinking about the markets and just be in the game. So taking the emotion out is key, having process is key, and then also I think being humble and knowing, hey, when there's a mistake, we got to move on. We, we, you know, we can't just let that drag us down. So um, another question came in, what are your thoughts on tech IPOs? We've seen a couple recently, wow, they've been hot some tech IPOs uh, and their popularity versus the already established tech companies. So what are your thoughts there, Tim? Should we go with the new guys or stick with the old dogs? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of this market right now is we have a large concentration in few companies in the technology sector. And so um, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Netflix, and Google um, you know, are now in excess or, or close to about 25% of the overall S&P 500. Uh, we've never seen that level of concentration since the, the uh, tech bubble. And the interesting different differentiation between um, now and then, or even looking back at the old nifty 50 type companies, is the valuation of these companies is not um, – uh, at a level where we have a significant concern. Um, these businesses are um, growing, growing very quickly. Uh, they're, they're in a strong financial position. They've, they have, uh, in many cases, no debt or very low debt. Um, their cash flows are improving, you know, quite significantly every single quarter, every single year, which allows them to reinvest back into their business, which allows them to pay out dividends, buy back stock, make acquisitions. Um, pay down debt. And, and so ultimately, I think that many of those companies, you know, ultimately are, are must owns, uh, whether you're investing in individual stocks or you're buying, you know, mutual funds and ETFs, which has uh, a significant exposure to those areas. And so I think those companies long term, um, and for full disclosure, I own many of them um, personally, and, and I, as do our clients and others on our investment committee, I, I think they can be anything that they want to be. Um, given their financial position, and I would imagine that over time, uh, when the valuation seems appropriate to make an acquisition, uh, that they'll continue to enhance and innovate and, and make their business model, um, enhance their business model and, and make it more um, relevant longer term. And so I certainly think that there's been some interesting companies that have gone public recently. Um, I think we're seeing a bit of a, a almost a revolution against the initial public offering. We've seen many companies come to public market through the special acquisition company, which is similar to the old pipe. Um, and, you know, some of those businesses are, are quite interesting as well. But the reality with many of those IPOs is, you know, they're, they're bleeding cash. Uh, they're over really relying upon the debt market and raising money through the capital markets by issuing new shares and diluting existing shareholders. Um, ultimately, you know, for the most part, many of these companies are just not mature enough for us to invest in. 
And that's not to say that something, you know, wouldn't come up that we got really excited about that met, met all of our criteria. But, um, you know, overall, I think there's a bit of exuberance going on in the IPO market right now. And um, we've seen that recently with some of the companies who have had come public um, really not perform well because their valuations when they came public were, were stretched. Yeah, it's a great answer, and and it is it's fascinating, you know. And I think of creative destruction, and and you know, we wow, Sears, who's even heard of it anymore? And Bethlehem Steel, it's all gone. And you know, what's going to happen is a lot of these companies are going to come. They're going to do great, and some are not. And we're going to know over the course of time. But I think that's where having a, a trusted advisor on your side to help navigate the 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 joys, the highs of a great IPO versus the the, the crashing blow of a downturn. So. Um, with that, everyone, that's the rest of the questions that have come in. We appreciate your time with us today and look forward to continuing to serve your needs well into the future. Thank you for joining. Remember to keep calm and, you know, keep calm. That's my message. Keep calm and keep calm. Thank you for joining and have a great autumnal season, everyone. Take care.